Welcome everyone to our Bible study here on this presentation of the Augsburg Confession Sunday, when uh, we Lutherans gather to remember the confessors of the 16th century and the uh, clarifying for the church of the day in the midst of corruption that we aren't saved by donations, we aren't saved by good works, we are saved by God's grace alone through faith alone in Jesus Christ alone. So welcome here to St. Matthew's on this day. We are back to 1 Corinthians, and we're going to be starting today into 1 Corinthians chapter 10. So you might want to start opening your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. The last few chapters, or the last couple of chapters, Paul's been dealing with different issues there in the church in Corinth. And the longer trajectory is the church has issues. He's gone through some of the different issues. There's... There's different groups battling, there's some arrogance, but the last bits he's been talking about is how do we then live as Christians, as new believers in this pagan society and a particularly pagan city of Corinth. And he talked about issues of family life. He talked about uh, meat which had been offered to uh, idols as sacrifices, and that's going to come up a little bit more in the next chapter as we start into chapter 10. In chapter 9, you might see that he was kind of beginning a trajectory into what's it like now to live as a mature believer in Jesus. 10, he's going to kind of go back to uh, the history of the Hebrew people and talk about some of the immaturity in their spiritual life, which led to problems. He doesn't do this to beat up on them per se. What he's trying to do is give an example to the Corinthians of let's learn from their lessons, the lessons that they had to learn from. And one of the words that gets used a lot here in chapter 10, or at least several times in chapter 10, is the word typos, basic root from which we get type, or in biblical terms, in, in biblical uh, interpretation, we talk about typology, typology. When we look uh, as New Testament believers back at the Hebrew Bible, what we call the Old Testament, we see examples or types. And in those types, we try to draw lessons. Certainly, uh, Jewish uh, believers would not view some of these things in the same way. Uh, for uh, instance, when we look at Adam, Paul tells us that Adam is the type of the first man, but then the new man is Jesus, right? Obviously, not everyone would agree with looking at it that way, but that's what Paul is doing here, is this looking at the original scriptures for types of the future. That first one is most clearly demonstrated. I mentioned this before, and some of you who have been to the Holy Land have seen there at the uh, Church of the Holy Sepulcher under... Mount Golgotha, there's a skull buried in the rock, and there's a window to see it, and tradition says, especially in Eastern Orthodox tradition, that that's Adam's skull, that Jesus was crucified on top of Adam. Well, we'd probably say that's pretty fanciful, but uh, uh, as far as a uh, uh, an illustration, maybe, that the new man has now bought the price of salvation for the old man and for all of us, there's some symbolism there. So Paul's going to go with those type symbols, those type types here, and that's what we're going to launch into in chapter 10. Julie, you want to start us with 1 Corinthians 10, verse 1. Okay, let me see here. Okay, for we must never forget, dear brothers, what happened to our people in the wilderness long ago. God guided them by sending a cloud that moved along ahead of them and brought them all safely through the waters of the Red Sea. So he, uh, the translation there, the paraphrase kind of spells it all out for us, what was happening. Paul begins this illustration with talking about our forefathers in faith. Again, most of the people reading this letter or hearing this letter are probably Gentile Christians, but still forefathers in faith were all under the same cloud, and they all passed through the sea. And that cloud was what? The presence of God. The presence of God. This, this idea of the, the pillar of cloud was leading them by day, the pillar of fire by night. 
Uh, anybody who's been, even if you've driven through the Mojave to Las Vegas, you may have seen those dust devils that rise up. Scholars would tend to associate that this was probably something like that, but they saw in this God's presence guiding them through the wilderness, and they all passed through the sea, which would be which story? The Red Sea. It's a party of the Red Sea. So our forefathers were led by God through the wilderness, and he, God even took them through the sea. And we can start to see an analogy to baptism, which he's going to go there in verse 2. Carolyn, please. And all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Now that's kind of an analogy. There wasn't a, there was ritual washing. They weren't necessarily baptized into Moses, but he's kind of trying to give us a type here. He's trying to use figurative language. So as they passed through the, the, the Red Sea, and again, it's probably wasn't as dramatic as Cecil B. DeMille, DeMille portrays it, but he does a great job of portraying it. Somehow they're brought through the sea, and uh, Paul now uses that as a symbol of God brings them through, and they were baptized in a sense in this in this mystical way. God's presence in the cloud divided the sea, and they were brought through the sea. More than that, Judy, verse three, please. And all ate the same supernatural food. Supernatural. That's an interesting Ooh. translation. Do you have other translations for supernatural? Spiritual. Spiritual. Okay. Good. That's probably the more common. Uh, food, sometimes it's translated meat, but food is the better translation. It's not just meaning flesh type food, but food in general. What do you think Paul's alluding to there, typologically? Manna. He's talking about manna. the manna. You could maybe say quail too, but he's really talking about the manna. And do you remember what the word manna or mana means? What is it? What is this? Yeah, what is this? Right. What is this stuff? There's, that's what is this stuff? Right. They all ate the same spiritual food. And of course, if you were listening today with the prayers, uh, Jesus is that true spiritual food, we would say. Here's the connection that Paul's making, that Jesus is the true bread from heaven, from John 6, which is... John taking the feeding of the 5,000 and tying it into that story of the manna. And now we have an even more mystical body that God feeds us with in Jesus. Beyond this food, Jean, verse 4. And all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them. And the rock was Christ. What's that referring to? What's his typological point here? Well, Got to strain a little bit more here, and it's not related to communion. Holy communion. Baptism? Mm, he's already kind of covered baptism with crossing the sea. What's this spiritual drink That's that they all drank from? From the rock. The living water? The living water? Oh. Yeah. Elaborate. Oh. Elaborate. Um, Jesus is the living water. That's where so you're kind of going. going. But um, hitting yes. rock with the. Oh, yeah. This is God rock. supplying water in the wilderness, right? That's right. And so there was a rabbinic tradition from this, which is, again, a fanciful tradition, most likely, but a rabbinic tradition which would have been common at the time of Paul's writing that there was actually a giant rock which followed the Israelites through the wilderness for 40 years. That this rock stood up and it gushed water, a rock 15 feet high, which gushed water, and that's how God provided the water for the people in the wilderness. And then they tied those stories in with Moses and striking and not supposed to be striking all that. But this, this tradition evolved that this 15 foot rock followed along. So look at how Paul ends that verse, he says, this rock was, was Christ. Right. So Paul takes that rabbinic tradition and ties it Christ. in here of saying it was actually Christ who was following the people. That is some deeper theology there because what Paul is saying is 
it was Christ, the second person of the Godhead, the pre-incarnate Christ, we would say, was actually with the people following along. This is the pre-existence of Jesus. This is testimony to the Trinity that Jesus was actually there with the people, with them, through the wilderness in this, in this way. Verse 5. I think if, it's a, if there's a rock following them, maybe that's why they use supernatural. Well, <laughs> I think I'd be a little bit <laughs> terrified. <laughs> so, uh, Melissa's here in the office. She wants to say. Uh, it's interesting because the, the one hymn that we share, and it's not the same words, but each tradition has a rock of ages hymn. Oh, uh, did you hear that? Melissa said both Judaism and Christianity have different versions, but we both have a rock of ages hymn. Okay. Yeah, so Mom, that would... Sir, and, Mm -hmm. I would definitely tie in. Yeah. And I, I mean, I don't imagine too many rabbis today talk about a 15 foot rock actually literally following the people, but that was the <laughs> tradition at the time. And often those traditions weren't necessarily meant to be literal, but they were meant to be teaching that, you know, so a way to explain something. Uh, Sandra, you're on mute, so I'm guessing we're not going to read here today. Okay. So, Pam, would you read five, please? Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. Their bodies were scattered over the desert. So here they were taken by God through the wilderness, through the sea. They were given living bread. They were given water. And yet God was not pleased with most of them, which is really a woeful understatement. Because how many of them actually made it to the promised land? Very few. Only the younger generation. So of the original ones who made it. Okay, kids, can I remember how to do this? I haven't, I, we don't do chapel lately because of COVID, so I haven't been doing singing this song. But 12 men went to spy on Canaan, 10 were bad and two were good. What did they see when they went to Canaan? 10 were bad and two were good. How many made it to Canaan? Two. Two. There, right. Even the preschooler is supposed to know that. Got it. <laughs> and who were they? Oh, uh, Joshua. Joshua, for Joshua sure. Joshua and? And the guy with the funny name. We have a pastor in the city with the same name, so I don't know if he's... <laughs> pastor. Caleb, maybe? Huh? Huh? Caleb, Joseph's right hand, yes, Joshua's right hand man. Right, Joshua, which is Yeshua, which is the same Hebrew name as Jesus, and his kind of right hand man. Joshua and Caleb were the two good ones who actually see the promised land. God was not pleased with most of them. He was not pleased with almost any of them. And their bodies were scattered. Do we have other translations than scattered? Overthrown. Overthrown is a more traditional translation. Anything else? It's just down. It, okay. The, the word can be pictured as a body lied down on a couch, flat on a couch. I was watching, I can't believe I had not seen this till uh, yesterday. I found on Roku. It's uh, like a two, two part mini series, which was released in 2007 about a, two, uh, about a pandemic hitting LA. And it's just amazing. It's really poorly done, I should say. So you may not want to find it. But it was somewhat interesting. And it had some stars you would recognize. Stars you would recognize. But it's it's this whole story of a kid who catches this thing in Australia. And he brings it on a plane to L.A. And the pandemic spreads through L.A. And it's just so much is so accurate of what ended up happening in 2020. It was just amazing how much they had how well the story fit in with what actually happened. But as the kid dies there on the plane, what do you do with this body? And I think when, I mean, it does happen that people die on planes. So I think they take, typically take them down if it's a big plane to the basement. Maybe Sandra has some insight here if they take them in the elevator. But in the movie on this giant 747, they just laid him out on the back seat. And the body was just there in a bag on the back seat for the rest of the trip. 
of course, infecting everybody is what happens. But there's a picture of this dead body flatly lying there, not moving. That's a word. That's a way that you can picture this, this verb. It can also almost be, think of a hurricane laying waste to everything, flattening everything. It could be used in that sense, too. It is. What was that? I said, like, tornadoes. Like a tornado would be similar, too. Just think of that. Oh, well, and there have been too many in the news near Carolyn lately where just think of how those towns have just been flattened, right? Yeah, that's the word here. Even though God brought them through this, God was not pleased with them, and they were just flattened out, flattened out, overthrown, as if the corpses were scattered through the wilderness. And that's interesting because one of the, one of the skeptical... Uh, or one of the, the lines of attack from some skeptics about the Exodus story is we haven't found archaeological evidence. And wouldn't you think that you'd be able to find some more archaeological evidence? If you look at Paul's take on this, he sees it as scattered across the whole Sinai. You'd be less likely to find archaeological evidence if stuff's still scattered. Now, there, we still don't have all the answers there. We can't just dismiss that question. But if their bodies are strewn all over instead of large burial grounds, that might make some sense that there aren't large areas. The people were just scattered all over. They were overthrown. Diane, verse 6, please. Now these things occur as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. Here's examples or any other words that you have there for example. Warnings. Warnings, okay. This is actually the word that I told you about in the introduction. This is tupoi, from which we get type. These things occurred as a type to keep us from setting our heart on the wrong things. And the word there for type, what it means, think of, oh, what was the production company that used used to be, you know, you always get those little things at the beginning of movies from the different production companies. And there's one where there's a, uh, he's got the forge type thing and the hammer and he knocks it into the Roman numerals. I can't remember what production company that was. Oh, yeah. Does that sound familiar to anybody with that? Yeah. And you hear the bang, bang. That was fun. Yeah, that's, that's the word here of that's that striking so that the impression is left. That's what type is. That's what it really means to type. From which we get our typewriter. Ty yeah, that's where typing comes from. Because what happens when you type? The thing. And we don't it do is. it anymore, but the little thing yeah. struck yeah. the thing. That's why we used that word when they designed typewriters. Yeah. 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 So that's what a type was. These things were the type so that we would always see it so that we would not set our hearts on evil things or sometimes translated that we're more that we would get uh, wrapped up in the same appetites that they did verse 7 Dennis please number seven now what's there's probably broad applications there of different times that happened but but given what Paul has just said, the examples he's just given, which particular incident do you think he's talking about here? The golden calf. He's probably referring here to the golden calf. And of course, again, we can picture Cecil B. DeMille's portrayal of this. And, and Cecil B. DeMille's voice is in the background, and he, he actually uses uh, from this verse, it would appear, as he describes... Uh, just how evil the people have gotten and and how horrible it is that they're doing that this their activity there is wrapped up in their idolatry and they got all wrapped up in their pagan revelry or do you have other translations than revelry and rose up to dance dance Play. Play. play there jeans got it and i'm pretty sure that uh, demille uses that word actually when he uh, does his portrayal that they're playing and that's what the word really means is they're playing like children 
The people are run wild, um, they're running amok, they're playing like children, dancing to this idol, to this golden calf. It's become an idolatrous festival. And of course, Moses Charlton Heston walks down the mountain and sees this and he throws the stones and he's angry. That's, that's the scene here. The people were eating and drinking. And what was Paul talking about in the last chapter? Sacrifices to idols and whether it was okay to eat the meat. And what did he come down? Basically, what was his answer? Ah, I already forgot. He basically said it's okay to eat the meat. That was basically the meat was allowed in those days. But you should refrain if there was a weaker brother or sister. And you shouldn't be participating in the pagan rites with this stuff. If you're just buying it the next day in the market, that's one thing. But don't be participating or celebrating these pagan deities. Don't be worshiping these false gods with it. Here he emphasizes how much this is tied together of eating and drinking and being wrapped up in this pagan worship. They, there in the wilderness, had become part of this pagan worship, worshiping the golden calf. Uh, and the golden calf is probably an image of Baal. And Baal is, uh, is an image of the male member. It's a fertility religion. Verse 8. Where are we at? Terry, please. We must not indulge in sexual immorality, as some of them did, and 23,000 fell on a single day. So he says, don't get wrapped up. And again, you can, if you can picture the Ten Commandments, so how they're carousing and they're going wild, that's, this, this, this is the scene that Paul's imagining, not from Cecil B. DeMille's point of view, but Paul's got the tradition that he knows at this point that they're, that they're doing all this, they're engaged in all of this, and he says that 23,000 of them die. And it's interesting, this would be one of those points where, where fundamentalism fails. Uh, in that he's wrong here. Paul is misquoting numbers. Does anybody know what numbers says? How many people died? Numbers says 24,000. Paul's reciting this from memory. He, doesn't have, you know, he knows the stories. He doesn't have a copy. He puts 23 instead of 4. 24. No big deal. But 24 is probably symbolic. doesn't literally mean 24,000 people died. But how do you get to 24,000? You take 12 times 12 times 10 times 10 times 10. What does 12 represent in the ancient numbers for the Jewish people? The 12 tribes. So people of all the tribes are involved in this immorality. All of the tribes there are gathered outside the mountain, and they're all involved in this. And 10 is the number for completeness. So it really means all of the people that were participating in this, basically, and that's probably hyperbole. There undoubtedly were those who were saying, I'm not going to get involved in this. But hyperbolically, the people were all involved, and so they all spiritually died. Yeah, some probably died there as a result of their sexual immorality. Maybe they caught diseases, whatever happened. But in a sense, they all spiritually died because they'd all given themselves over to the worship of Baal. Verse 9, where are we, I guess we go back to Julie. Her. Okay, let me see. And don't try the Lord's patience. They did and died from snake bites. And those of you who are here at St. Matthew's, as we've been doing our Disney series, we talked about this recently, the story of snakes and what snakes represent. And this came up as one of the readings not that long ago, the story of the people were there in the wilderness and they were bitten by vipers. And so they cry out to God for help. And what's the answer? They were given a solution. Snake on the pole. Moses puts a bronze snake on a pole and all they have to do is look to the sacrifice on the pole and they are healed. So some apparently didn't believe that and some died, others turned. And that we see again as a type of, this is figurative, prefiguring Jesus on the cross as the true Savior. Those who look to Jesus for salvation find salvation. Some of them were killed by snakes because they were putting the Lord to the test and they wouldn't listen to what God was saying. And then he gives another example here. Carolyn 10, please. 
nor grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. And again, we can picture the movie somewhat. Uh, if you remember kind of the, that green cloudy hand coming from the sky, the angel of death, which is most the it, most the Israelites are okay because they put the blood on the posts and the death passes over, but some didn't believe. Some kept murmuring and the destroyer came against them and some died in their unbelief. <coughs> and there's different references in Exodus to that. God was setting the people free. He had set the people free. He brought them out of captivity in Egypt. He was giving them a new land. He was making a new nation out of them. And yet when you read the story, they want to go back constantly to the flesh pots of Egypt, it says, because at least they knew what life was like there. And when we picture slavery, what they were enduring probably wasn't quite what we picture, not like how African-Americans were held in bondage in this country. It was more a captive workforce, but we've, we have the archaeological ruins of the places they lived in Goshen, and they weren't really that bad, but you couldn't leave. You were kind of a captive workforce, but you had food to eat. And now out in the wilderness, they had to put their faith in God. And that was a matter of faith, and that was harder. Even if you remember uh, in Lawrence of Arabia, when things are going badly, the reporter who's from New York or whatever commenting, he brings up that line of they always want to go back to the flesh pots in Egypt. It's easier to go back to I'm going to depend on myself than put my faith truly in God. But because they didn't put their faith in God, that's why all of these things befall them. These things happen. Verse 11, Judy, please. None of these things happened to them as a warning. <clears throat> but they were written down for our instruction, upon whom the end of the ages has come. These things were the examples. Again, this is the word type. These things were the types, the examples to us, and they were even written down for us in the stories of the Torah. These things were written so that they could be a warning, or what else do you have besides warning? Instruction. Instruction. Instruction could be admonition. This was written down to kind of tell future generations. And that's how we see the stories of first the oral tradition, which ends up being written down. You use this to teach, not just in biblical terms, but isn't that how stories are passed from generation to generation to serve as warnings and to teach. These stories now, Paul is saying, are now part of even your Gentile Christian heritage, and they should serve as warnings to you now, as they did for the Jewish people for all these generations, warnings to let go of this arrogance, to trust in God, to put your faith in, in God, and not to think that you are going to be able to go back to the flesh pots of Egypt, which for the Corinthian Christians wouldn't be going back to the flesh pots of Egypt, but would be what? Going back to their paganism. Boy, this Christianity thing is certainly turning out tough. It'd be a lot simpler if I joined Joe next door and we went to make a sacrifice to Athena, right? That's That was the temptation for them, not the golden calf so much. Okay, we're going to leave off there today. We have about one minute, maybe, if there's any questions. I have a question. Uh -huh. yeah. So this is probably really really dumb but when Moses did the um made the put the brass snake on the pole why a snake well and that's interesting because a snake was associated with evil in the ancient world yeah both the Babylonians particularly the Babylonians but also the Egyptians worshipped snake gods so it's almost as if it's a play somehow there uh it could be, I mean, scholars debate this, of course, but it could be that it's it's Jewish tradition mocking the false snake god of Babylon. It's probably after the Babylon, or it's probably during the Babylonian captivity that the story is written down. It could be mocking that, you know, those Egyptian gods, you've got a snake god, did nothing. But our god can take even something evil like a snake and turn it around and use it. But it's not fully clear why the snake. 
it's it's not just Judaism and Christianity that have that symbol, though. It also creeps up in in Greco-Roman culture. In what form? And it's part of our medical, medical yeah, the caduceus, yeah. So that that same basic image comes in from different cultures of ancient cultures in the different mythologies of of this snake wrapped around a pole. So it could be that God is uh, that they're he's simply using uh, an image that the people would have known, but he's turning it around now. Adam is that a wise? What, Dalton? Adam and Eve had a wise son in right. the garden. Right. And, be, and beyond the Genesis story, there were lots of rabbinical traditions that had evolved around the snake. So that could be tied in there, too. Pam, you were going to say something more? Well, didn't you say it was almost analogized to Jesus on the cross? Well, that's, what, cross? that's what's going to be for the New Testament, yes. We see, as we look back at the story as, as New Testament Christians, we see this as pointing this is type typology the same word here the type of uh, eventually the answer is going to be to look to the one sacrificed on the cross the one who's lifted up lift high the cross the one who's going to be lifted up for all humankind okay so then it, okay i think i've got it now in my head I, it's typology wondering the snake on the cross and then jesus and i was yeah. it's i you. mean it, it is odd for our perspective to think well snake symbolizing Jesus. Yeah. It is a little weird. There's no doubt about that. But that's where, with any analogy or metaphor, you can always, the, the danger is, if you want it to be too literal, it always falls apart. Right? Yeah. Thank you. Okay, let's close with prayer. As people of the Beatitudes, we now pray to our God. We pray for the people of God, poor in spirit, that they may not be engrossed by the material possessions of this world. In faith we pray, God, receive, God our, receive prayer. Our, our prayer. We pray for those in the world who hunger and thirst for what is right, that they will be strong and not give in to defeat. In faith we pray, God, God receive, receive our, prayer. our prayer. We pray for those who mourn the loss or the sickness of family or friends, that they might be given comfort in their sorrows. In faith we pray, God, God receive, God, our, receive prayer. our prayer. We pray for those who have hurt us, that we may be generous and wholehearted in our forgiveness. In faith we pray, God, God receive, receive our, receive our, our prayer. prayer. Almighty and ever-living God, with confidence we place these prayers before you in the name of Jesus, who is Lord forever and ever. Amen.